invite you to turn with me, if you have your Bibles, it will be on the screen, um, to uh, Matthew chapter 4. <clears throat> I'm in the New International Version, Matthew chapter 4. Um, last week we were in chapter 3, marvelous how that works, chapter 4 follows chapter 3. I've always been amazed by that. Um, uh, chapter 3 is where uh, John the Baptist, we're introduced to John the Baptist. He's in the wilderness baptizing people, calling them to repent, to come near, to, to see near, back to God because the kingdom of heaven was coming near. He was this voice of one calling in the wilderness. And, and we talked about the fact that, that Matthew's brought John as kind of a, a te- one to testify, one to bring witness uh, to something that Matthew declared right back at the beginning of chapter 1, where he said, uh, I'm going to tell you about uh, Jesus, the anointed one, the Messiah, the one who has come in response to all of the Old Testament anticipation. And now this prophet, this New Testament prophet, John, has spoken in support of what Matthew has said. And then you get to the end of chapter 3, and Jesus was baptized by John. Um, but that baptism was to fulfill all righteousness, uh, demonstrating again uh, who, God, who John, G- Jesus is. Uh, and Matthew then takes us uh, on the next step in this journey, uh, on the heels of the Father saying, this is my Son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. And here's chapter 4, verse 1. This is the word of the Lord. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, Throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor, and all this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan. For it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. This is the word of the Lord. May he help us understand it and walk in light of it uh, this this morning and through the balance of our lives. Um, I don't know if you ever had an opportunity to be in the presence of somebody really famous. Um, Ever had that kind of experience where you get a little weak at the knees, not quite sure what you know the proper protocol is, what you can say, what you can't say. Um, uh, I remember when I was a kid, um, our family was quite excited about going and seeing Queen Elizabeth. She was coming to London, Ontario. We lived about an hour away from there when I was a kid, and um, uh, this was quite an event. Queen was coming, going to get you know be able to see her. her Funny thing is, I have no memory, no recollection of actually seeing her. Um, it, what, my memory is actually the memory of sort of the hurrah of our family getting ready and what a cool thing this was going to be. Um, so take royalty, for instance, and imagine, if you would, um, an opportunity where you're actually going to be given audience with royalty. Let's, let's say William and Kate. Kate okay? so, so you get the opportunity, maybe you're going to get to share a meal with them. Can you envision that? Kind of the... the, 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 the the pomp, the circumstance, the, the beauty of the spectacle of, of it, uh, maybe a little bit of nerves, right? Um, now, imagine that in the middle of the second course of the meal, um, you turn to Will and challenge his right to the throne uh, of the British Empire. Okay, England. Um, I, I, I imagine, in addition to this, it's not the first time that you've done this, that actually, in history, you mounted a full-scale assault on the royal family to unseat them and put yourself in that place. And now here you are at dinner, saying it again. I know this would never happen. It's kind of ridiculous because security just wouldn't have given you access a second time. (laughs) But imagine, that's effectively what's going on here, okay? That's effectively what's taken place in the wilderness as, as the devil has come and has, once again, challenged Jesus' right to the throne. And you think the arrogance of such a position. 
Like the pride, the effrontery that is part of that. You say, how can such a thing exist? Who in the right mind would ever consider something like that? And it begins to, to help us understand a little bit about what's, what's broken and what's going wrong in the world. Because at work is this treason against the Most High God that is vile, that, that is audacious, that, that is proud and self-serving, and gives no, no right or credence to the fact that, that, that the rightful maker and, and sustainer and benefactor of the universe is the one who is rightfully acknowledged as God. It's his rightful place, and it's right and fitting that we would address him accordingly. And there is an enemy, there is an adversary at work against his purposes. So I've got a few questions about this passage. I suspect you might as well. Uh, here are my top three questions that I'm going to kind of address this morning. Number one, uh, who is this tempter? What's going on there? Secondly, what is the significance of these temptations? Why those temptations? What's up with the temptations? And then thirdly, what does Jesus' victory here? He didn't yield to the temptations. You read it with me. What does his victory over those temptations mean for, for you and me? Those are the questions that are in your sermon notes. If you want to pull them out of your bulletin, um, get, you can follow along, maybe make a few notes as we go, maybe a few questions. Just a suggestion, if you were to collect your sermon notes over the course of weeks, months, uh, you'd have yourself a nice little commentary on vast portions of the scripture. Um, collect them. We've got some three ring binders, little guys like this. Um, I think we've got like two bucks for, and we've got a few of them. We can get more if, if there's demand. Um, but just a suggestion of a way of uh, stewarding God's word as you study, uh, we study together and collect them together. Who is the tempter? What are these temptations about? And then what does Jesus' victory here mean for you? So who's the tempter? So uh, Diabolos or Diabolou um, here is, a, uh, that's the Greek, is transliterated. So when something's transliterated, we kind of take the original language and approximate it in another language. Diabolus, devil, is a transliteration of the Greek. Um, he's described here as the tempter, uh, which is a, a good word to, to kind of describe what he does. Um, literally, uh, Diabolus means uh, to slander or to accuse. Um, if we were in the Hebrew and wanted to say the same thing, we would use the word Satan. Okay, so Satan is the Hebrew, devil is the Greek. Um, and and when, we, when we bring those references throughout the pages of Scripture together, we kind of get this composite of this character, this being, that looks something like this. Um, he was an angelic being who rebelled against God, leading a third of the heavenly host, a third of the angelic realm, uh, in an ongoing revolt against God's leadership. You could read about that, or at least the beginnings of it, Luke chapter 10, verse 18, Revelations 12, 4. Um, I've used the, name, the words uh, devil and Satan. Uh, sometimes the, you've heard the word Lucifer. Um, that comes from Isaiah 14, 12, um, and it's the way the King James and the New King James translate uh, son of the morning. Um, whole scholarly conversation going on there. Isaiah's talking about um, uh, the king of Babylon and he describes them in these disparaging ways. And uh, people have said, well, that sounds like more than an earthly king. Is this also referring to, um, is this also referring to Satan? Um, anyway, I'll let you dig into that yourself sometime. sometime. But that's where that word, the name Lucifer comes from. Uh, you won't find it in your NIV, your NASB, NLT. It doesn't, get, it doesn't show up in the modern translations, uh, just so you know. Um, he was an angelic being. Uh, he was tempting humanity in the Garden of Eden. And he continues to do so. So he shows up in this, this character, the serpent that tempts in the Garden, and he continues to do that kind of work. Um, that's what he does. He tempts, he um, uh, slanders, um, he calls for attention to himself rather than to God. Um, he actively obstructs the work of God. You could read about that in Job chapter 1, in Luke chapter 22, verse 3, John 6, verse 70, all, all kinds of places. He obstructs the work of God in the world, and he's described in the following kind of language. Matthew 9, uh, John 8, 44, he's described as the prince of darkness. He's described as the father of lies. 
Uh, he's described as the murderer from the beginning. So you begin to get a composite of what this character is like. And Matthew 25, 41, uh, Revelation 20, 10, promise us that he will be judged. He will be judged and punished uh, because of the rebellion that he's led against God. So that's who the tempter is. But what about the temptations? What's up with these temptations? So all three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, make reference to this. Mark just sort of says it happened. Um, uh, Matthew and Mark give us more detail concerning what happened, list the three temptations that the, the, the Jesus experienced. Uh, Luke inverts the, the sequence of the final two. He's got a little different sort of way of telling the account, a different point that he's making. Matthew's sequence here seems to be kind of a logical sequence uh, from lowest to highest, from, from least to greatest. Um, it, it goes from bread to show yourself um, uh, by, 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 by throwing yourself down to uh, worship me. Kind of, you know, if we could put it in those kind of terms, Make bread seems a little bit less significant than defy the first commandment and worship me instead of God. Okay, so, um, but you can also kind of look at it in this sequence where he kind of goes from wilderness to highest point of the temple. It's where the second temptation comes from, center of the world for the Jewish people, to the highest point of a mountain. Uh, so there's kind of sequen sequence built into uh, the, the way John is, uh, the way uh, Matthew's telling the story here, um, and and this comes on the heels of Jesus' baptism, uh, where in that just previous passage, um, he Matthew has been arguing that Jesus is the Son of God who has has been obedient to the Father. He has done what what ancient Israel was never able to do. He's become the obedient son. He has become the stand-in for Israel. And, and, and in so doing, he becomes the stand-in for you and for me as well. And in demonstrating this, Matthew is kind of taking this a little further when you get to chapter 4, saying, look, Jesus is able and willing to prevail in this assignment. Yes, he's been given the assignment, but he's able and willing to prevail in the assignment. He will do what is necessary. Uh, Jesus has got what it takes. Where others have failed, Jesus will not fail. He will prevail. And, and the temptation of Jesus looks, looks a lot like some other stuff that's happened kind of no, uh, notoriously among the human race throughout the pages of history. This looks, this looks a, a lot like, or it's reminiscent of, what took place in the Garden of Eden, where Adam and Eve saw the fruit, food, okay, saw food, thought it was good, pleasing to the eye, um, desirable for gaining wisdom. Um, some parallels. It sounds a little similar to, to, to the temptations that we see here in the wilderness. Um, Moses and the Israelites, they were led by God into the, into the wilderness. Uh, we're told here that the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. Um, in the wilderness, the children of Israel were called to trust God, called to follow him, but they didn't. Um, and there's something going on there about the bread and manna, right? About water and whether or not they had enough of it. Uh, and then Moses is taken to this high mountain to survey the land, uh, though he will not be allowed to go into it. So again, there's kind of these, these parallels, these illusions that will go back. In fact, if we were to trace the passages of Scripture that Jesus uses to counter each temptation, they all come from Deuteronomy. They all come from the verge of the promised land. And Matthew's drawing a very clear parallel to what's taking place there. So, so this looks a little bit like Adam and Eve in the garden. It looks, it looks a lot like Moses and the Israelites in the wilderness. This looks a lot like you and me. Uh, the Apostle John, in his letter, 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, warns us against the temptations of the world. And he says, specifically, beware the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the sinful pride of life. And if we were to examine those more closely, we would find that, again, there are some parallels there. So not only is Jesus identifying with Israel past, but he's identifying with you and me. And he's become our stand-in as the son who will obey, the son who is able to accomplish and do what neither Israel nor we are able to do in our own strength. So, so, so then when the, the writer of the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, says, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. He's referring at least in part to what's going on here. The temptation of Jesus, Matthew chapter 4.
And so we talk about what's going on with Jesus in the wilderness here. And we're going to pause on that word for a couple of minutes to say, okay, what's up with God and the wilderness? He leads the, ch- the, the children of Israel with Moses into the wilderness. He leads Jesus into the wilderness. Like, has he got a thing about cacti or something like that? Like, is there something going on where he just likes sand? Um, and, and then if you were to take it the next step further and say, and come to think of it, I've been in the wilderness a time or two myself. We've got to ask, okay, what's going on in the wilderness? God led the children of Israel into the wilderness. You can read about that in the book of Exodus. Um, Deuteronomy recounts some of that. We were in that book last year. But, but you'll, you may recall the cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night. He led them out of Egypt, out of slavery. Uh, he parted the waters of the Red Sea and then led them into wilderness. It, it, it led them out to the Mount Sinai. And you know what? The wilderness was a great place. It was a place they, they'd been taken from slavery. It was a place that was on, on their way to the promised land. It was a place where God was, was, was speaking to his children and inviting them to listen to him, to, to, to respond to him. It was a place where they were being invited to receive his care and his compassion, where he was going to feed them. He was going to give them manna. He did give them manna from heaven. He'd even give them a few birds uh, to to meet meet up the diet a little bit. Um, He was being generous to them, and he provided for them in the desert. Their responsibility was to to look ahead to him, to follow him. It it kind of reminds me, it's it's maybe one of the reasons why I, I love road trips, there's something about a road trip. You know, you finally get the family in the car, and, and, and all that remains now is to drive, right? It's just about the road ahead. Um, we, we've done hundreds of thousands of kilometers as a family uh, on road trips over the years. And, 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 and frankly, they have a little bit of trouble prying the spirit, steering wheel out of my hands because um, I just like to drive. Somebody else can navigate uh, you know, somebody else can, can select the tunes or the stories we're going to listen to. But, you know, the, the, the multitasking of, of my ongoing regular life is kind of set aside for, for, for these hours on the road. The, the, the deadlines, the, the pressurized schedules, all of that has to wait. It has to be put on hold because we, we just look at the road ahead and, and we drive. And then at the end of the drive, we got somewhere. It's a wonderful thing. Um, the wilderness was a place where God met with his, chil- with his children, with his people. He called them to look forward, to follow him, and, and just to stay the course and drive. And it was an awesome experience until it wasn't. Until it wasn't. The experience was working as God intended it. it, it and there was design to the wilderness experience. God calling his people apart, inviting them to give him their full attention, demonstrating to them his care and his compassion and his concern. He provided manna, bread for them. He gave them these special treats as they went along. And it all worked marvelously until the people stressed about, oh my goodness, we don't have enough water. God has brought us here into the wilderness to kill us. How could he do such a thing? forgetting, it would seem, almost instantly, uh, that he had already been providing, and surely there's a track record here that we could lean on. But fear gave way to hostility, and they blamed God. In fact, the, the, the point of it was their leader was Moses. They wanted to kill Moses for taking them into the wilderness. He brought us here to die, um, but their accusation was really against God. And, and that was when game was over. That, that was when... Flat tire and blown engine, and the road trip's done. You know? And and unfortunately for that generation, they would die in the wilderness. And that's that's what's behind the devil's temptations here. Um, that, That first one in particular, where he says, look, don't trust God. Jesus, you've been in the wilderness here for 40 days. Clearly, if God was going to show up with bread, he would have done so by now. You can't trust him, so you're going to have to do it yourself. So command bread to, to, and, and meet your need yourself rather than waiting for him to meet your need. Uh, break out of your human weakness. Draw down some of the divine power, O oh, son of God, and, and call the stones to become bread. 
The temptation is the invitation to not trust the one who has demonstrated himself to be supremely trustworthy. Adam and Eve were invited in a very similar way to fail on this question of trust. Trust. The language the devil used, the serpent used in the garden was, did God really say, he's really not going to show up, he's not going to be faithful to you. And it's language that we hear over and over and over and over again. Forgetting, I, I don't know if you noticed this, I suspect you did, that, that this begins with Matthew saying, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Like seemingly forgetting that God had intent in the wilderness. There was purpose in the wilderness. The, the children, the, Jesus was taken there on purpose. And it's no surprise to God that the tempter showed up and does what the tempter does. Uh, he, he, he brings accusation. He casts doubt. He invites you to take your eyes off of the one that you're to be looking toward. And all of a sudden, you find yourself in a ditch. It's in a ditch of, of wallowing. It's in a ditch of not knowing. It's in a ditch of failing to trust God and forgetting that he's actually the one who's called you here and will be with you in the midst of the desert that you found yourself in. Forgetting, perhaps, that he has made the promise that he will never leave us nor forsake us but that's what the tempter does. But Jesus prevailed. Jesus didn't fall for it. He's the one who, I mean, though he knew Israel had not prevailed, he was willing to go there for us. And he did go there knowing that you and I in our own strength can't prevail either. So now when we lose, those of us who have looked to Jesus find that all the Father sees is, is, is his win, is Christ's win for us. That, that when we blow it, what he sees is Christ's success. When we find ourselves travailing in the midst of brokenness, the Father sees us in Christ as those who have prevailed. The Son of God, God's faithful Son, fills both Israel's need and yours and mine. The Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. He had designed, he had purpose in that. Now, I, that maybe sounds strange to you. I know it does to me. I, I mean, the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness, and Satan led Jesus to the temple. Like, how backwards is that? Like, shouldn't it be the other way around? Surely, how could God, how could a good God ever leave, lead me to a place of desert if he loves me, why would he insist that I experience something like this? And then the corollary, what's Satan doing taking Jesus to church? Why is he taking him to the temple when his intent was not to invite him to worship God? Now, the first temptation was command bread to appear. The second temptation is inviting Jesus to force the hand of the Father it begins by twisting Scripture into something it was not intended to say. Um, here's what, what Matthew chapter 4, verse 6. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written. So they're on like a couple hundred feet up in the highest point of the temple. Throw yourself down, for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Does Scripture say that? Yes, it does. Psalm 91. Um, and, and let me ask you this. Does God protect his children? Is he, is he intimately concerned about your well-being, about what's going on in the details of your life? The answer is yes, he is. In fact, that's what Psalm 91, which the devil quoted there, that's what Psalm 91 invites us to sing. Psalms were, were the hymn book of, of the ancient Hebrews. So they would gather on Saturday and sing. And they would, if they sang from Psalm 91, they would sing about him, God being their high tower, their stronghold, their shelter. This is that psalm that talks about you don't need to fear the arrow that flies by day nor the pestilence that stalks by night. Because those who have put their trust in the Most High God 
will know his shelter. Listen to what one devotional writer um, offers. He says, Jesus embraces the principle of scriptura sui interpres. Latin for scripture is its own interpreter. Proper interpretation of God's word always takes into account the entire canon of scripture. True, the passage the devil quotes, Psalm 91 verses 11 to 12, does promise God's people protection, but it does not allow us to risk our lives needlessly. As Jesus says, quoting from Deuteronomy 6.16, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. So here's, Jesus, here's Satan tempting Jesus to test God. Put him to the test. I'll take you to the place of worship where God has promised to show up among his people and command his blessing on those who worship him. Test a minute. See if this is true. If you are the son of God, demonstrate it and, and, and force the hand of God. Now in it, he's actually inviting Jesus to do the opposite of what Psalm 91 actually uh, encourages us. Uh, Psalm 91 the, the psalmist is saying this. He's saying, look, if you put your trust in the Most High, when you're in a tough spot, don't despair. Don't despair. God is going to be with you in that. God's got your back. But Satan, in the second temptation, is turning this on its ear, saying, look, do something that will require God to act. Force his hand in this thing. In the Garden of Eden, similar kind of thing. Did God really say... He's holding out on you. You really can't trust him. Probably should take matters into your own hands. Apostle John warning us, beware the lust of the flesh. He's, he's, pointing to, he's pointing to the temptation to just try to get it all now. The lust of the flesh. What can I gather? What can I accumulate? What can I, can I draw to me through my own strength and effort? And this is at the heart of this appeal to prove that he's Messiah. Prove that now by, in, this, in this illicit way. So, so the first temptation, command the stones to be bred. Second temptation, throw yourself down and force the hand of God. Third temptation was the most vile. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. So, so let's just cut to the chase, Jesus. Like, why don't you skip all those lower rungs on the ladder and I'll put you straight at the top of the ladder. Why don't, you, why don't you just let go of all that messy human being stuff, all that bloody cross, costly, painful sacrifice, and I will just give you what you want. All you've got to do is bow down and worship me. Um, I'm sure it's not lost on him that the invitation is to violate the first commandment. I have no other gods before me. Don't worship anyone other than me. Satan is attempting here to buy worship, and that's what he does. We see his character showing up in this. He buys worship. It's a quid pro quo kind of system. You scratch your back, I'll scratch mine. Um, if you do these things, I will give you. There are always hooks attached to it, by the way. And, and then here's the most dangerous hook, is that, is that we as human beings tend to think God works this way, and he doesn't. God is not a quid pro quo God. He does not work in an I scratch your back, you scratch mine. And some of us have, have fallen into the trap of thinking, jeepers, God must be punishing me for, for, what I, for what I did and that's what's going on. Never. That's not how God works. He might, he might chasten. He might correct. He might steer. But God brings, reacts to you out of grace. Favor that you have not and could not earn. And then invites us to be coached and trained by him. He invites us to worship him, not for what he does, but for who he is. Satan buys worship. Listen to what scholar Rodney Reeves writes. He says, Jesus refused to embrace false worship among the many reasons he knew that you serve what you worship. And what good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? So that's who the tempter is, that at least in part is what these three temptations are about. What does Jesus' victory mean for us? And Jesus did not yield, so what does that mean for us? Well, no, number one, it means this. It, it means that everything the prophet John the Baptist said about Jesus was and is true. 
It means, number two, that, that what the voice of the Father said has been validated, has been affirmed here. It was an accurate assessment. Jesus is the Son who will not disappoint. And here's the demonstration. Israel disappointed in the, in the wilderness. Jesus has not. You may disappoint in your own wilderness, but Jesus has not. Which leads us then to, to the kind of the third sort of so what in this. It means that you can stop striving. There's an invitation to look to Jesus, to be found in Jesus, to put your faith in Jesus, to secure your life to Jesus, and then stop striving, stop trying to prove yourself, stop trying to, to demonstrate that somehow you are good enough. You're not, never have been, never can be. But the invitation is to be found as righteous declared right before God in Christ by putting your faith and your trust in Jesus. And, and, then, stop, and then under that blessing, um, begin to walk and live your life. And I know this is hard for some of us. Some of, some of you will continue to live under the lack of affirmation that parents were ever able to give you. And it didn't matter how hard you tried, you never got an attaboy, you never grew up. And you continue to live out of this broken way of thinking. They may have done the best that they could do. But we then impose that view of God onto God. That, that, that somehow he's like them and I can never measure up. And it doesn't matter if I bring home straight A's. That, that he still is not going to approve of me. And I better try a little hard. Stop striving. Stop striving. Christ has done it for us and invites us to step into relationship with the Father through him and through his work. Here's a fourth thing that this impl implies. It, it means that you are never alone in the wilderness. As you step into the wilderness, as the children of Israel stepped into the wilderness, as Jesus stepped into the wilderness, I know some of you are in a very desolate, dry, bleak, and barren desert place. And for some of you who have been there a long time, Job, family, marriage, kids, health. And I'm sorry. And yet, the wilderness can be the best place in the world to be. Because in this place, God calls for my attention. He invites me to listen to him. He invites me to hear his voice and be responsive in it because there's nothing else I can do but trust him. And so I'm not going to command my own bread into being. I'm not going to try to force the hand of God. I'm not going to make a deal with the devil. What I'm going to do is I'm going to fix my eyes on Jesus and I'm going to let him lead me. I'm going to take the next step that he shows me and I'm going to walk in obedience as best I can and when I screw up, Jesus invites me to come back because there's forgiveness through confession and repentance. And I keep looking ahead at him because Jesus is able and willing to prevail in his assignment. He will do what is necessary. Jesus has got what it takes. And where others have failed, Jesus will prevail beginning of that psalm that the devil quoted. Psalm 91, verse 1. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest, will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God. I trust him.